Matthew chapter 26. With a little bit of this introduction that I'm going to give, it will sound like it may not be connected to where we're going, but you will see it is. But we must speak of two of the seven feasts of the Lord that have taken place in the last couple of weeks all over the world. Because we, as a New Testament church that knows the Word of God, we understand that all seven of those feasts of the Lord that, were, that originated, that were spoken of by God from Mount Sinai, recorded in Leviticus 23, we know that all seven are the backbone of the entirety of the Scripture all the way through to Revelation because they're all mentioned over and over. And when you get into the New Testament, you discover they're all mentioned around the person of Jesus Christ. They're called holy moeds, which means appointed days or appointed feasts. They're also called in Hebrew in Leviticus 23, mikras which means rehearsals. As I've said before, a rehearsal speaks to the real thing that's coming. The rehearsal's important. The rehearsals are almost always fun and celebrative. Like think of a wedding. But the rehearsal's not the real, real thing. But it's a reflection of the real thing that's to come. And it's really important that we rehearse, right? That's what mikra means. All of the seven feasts are called mikras. Rehearsals for what? For fulfillment in Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all through the New Testament, it proclaims he is our Passover lamb. He is the unleavened bread. He is the firstborn from among the dead. He is the giver of the Holy Spirit that births the church. He is the one that will sound the trumpets or blow the trumpets or call for the order of the trumpets being blown. He is the great high priest of Yom Kippur. He is our tabernacle. Give the Lord a hand of praise all the way through. I mean, and when I say all the way through, I mean that literally. There are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, 21 and 22, begin with the words I'm getting ready to say, but then it goes on and it expands, expands upon that word and the deep spiritual meaning. And my purpose is not to preach through Revelation this morning, but I just want to tell you this. So the last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. Listen to these words, Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, now the tabernacle of God is is among his people and he will tabernacle with them and they will tabernacle with him and then it goes on to say how that works and how awesome and beautiful it is in a lot of english translations you won't find the word the word tabernacle but in the greek it is the exact synonym of the hebrew word and it translates tabernacle or dwell, most, most in English translations will say he will dwell with us and we will dwell with him. Tabernacle is a dwelling place. Until we're with him, it was meant to be a temporary dwelling place. Like the tabernacles in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt, they wouldn't always live in those shacks and tents. They had to move around with them. But they celebrate that even to this day, the Orthodox. Even those that don't know Yeshua is the fulfillment of it. They celebrate it because they realize that those moving tents are kind of like our bodies and lives. We move around for a little while until we are in my father's house are many dwelling places. <laughs> and if I go away, I will go and prepare a place for you so that you may be where I am. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes unto the presence of my father but by me. You see how it all ties together? So this last couple of weeks, last week I told you we had the Lord's Supper, and I tied to it that the Feast of the Trumpets, and I went into a big deal about that. I'm not going to re-preach it, but that's the first of the three last fall feast trumpets, and then Yom Kippur, which happened just a few days ago. In the seventh month, Ethanim. And so just a couple of days ago, Yom Kippur started in the middle of that seven, that, uh, no, excuse me, that the seven-day feast comes with tabernacles just a few days from now, and then the fall feast will be completed. 
We read in the scriptures in John chapter 7, 8, 9, and probably 10 scholars don't quite know exactly where Jesus was there, but he was in Jerusalem. And, and we find Jesus and the disciples at the Feast of Tabernacles during all of that. The last of the fall feast. Then you go around the corner of the year and you wind up in the first of the feast, Passover, which is where he laid his life down as the Lamb of God and the bread of life and rose on the day of the feast of the first fruits from the ground. You see it? So we're right in the middle of that season in the fall right now. That's important because they are tied to prophecy. We don't set dates here, and I don't even try to manipulate those feasts into some kind of date setting. I'm just saying somehow we know the blowing of the trumpets is a part of the last days. Jesus says it. Paul says it. The Word of God says it so clearly. We know that. We also know that the feast, or it's not called the feast, it's called Yom Kippur, the day of covering, the day of atonement. That whole thing represents the work of the high priest who, who speaks to God to cover the sins. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, it gets deeper than that in a minute. In a minute, give the Lord a hand, and, and you'll see you'll see the the personal relevance of what I'm getting ready to bring. But this is all just kind of I'm tying together what's happening with the feasts and what this message is about, and what's happening in the world, and what's happening in your life, in my life. So Yom Kippur happened just a few days ago. The, the basic of that, and again, you can read Leviticus 16, and I've preached on that before. It's beautiful. It goes through the whole. It sounds, it's a very odd chapter if you don't know it's fulfilled in Jesus, if you don't know the New Testament, because it talks about the high priest, and he takes a goat and two goats and a lamb, sends one into the wilderness, takes a lamb, sacrifice blood, takes it into the Holy of Holies, and, and then he does, he has a ritual bathing, and then he puts on the, the, the white linen garments of the, of the high priest, but after he's done with all this sacrificing he takes off the linen garments and folds them perfectly leaves them in the temple then he appears in front of the people as kind of a regular guy it's all a picture of everything he is the great high priest he was the lamb that was slain that became the goat of our sin and was driven into the wilderness give the lord a hand now for you farmers out there understand that see a goat is a filthy form of a lamb <laughs> I mean I mean you know symbolically I mean a goat is a pig with hair <laughs> but a little lamb so innocent and sweet and just cuddly and, well they're animals so they're not perfectly clean either but I mean but for the lamb breed they're the gorgeous little, I mean, kids, kids in the ancient days would make pets out of them. Some farm children still do. Very few have a goat for a pet. They're cantankerous. They're nasty. They stink. So you see the imagery here. The imagery of you take that precious, sweet little lamb and sacrifice it and take that blood and put it over the Ark of the Covenant. And only the great high priest can do that. You see the imagery of Jesus? But then they bring out as imagery the goat. And the priest then takes his hands and puts it on the head of the goat, symbolically transferring the sins of the nation onto that goat. And they send it out into the wilderness. They take it way, way out, never to be seen again. It is cast as far as the east is from the west. Amen. The sins of the people are many. But God's mercy, if you're willing to come under the blood of the Lamb, is more. You see the symbolism? So we're in the middle of all of that season. The next thing that comes is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, so think about this. Not setting dates, not even hinting. I'm just saying I know what they mean, and I know the season we're in. But I just, I think that somewhere in this season of the year, when the Lord returns, is probably going to be associated with these feasts. Just because all the others were perfectly fulfilled in him, 
The trumpets will blow. We do know that. We do know that if you're under the atonement of the blood of the great high priest, you will be passed over by the wrath that he is bringing out on this world. Like in Noah's day, the flood came. In Lot's day, the fire from heaven fell. But they were spared. They were saved. Why? They were servants of the Most High. Everybody understand? And then at the end of all of that, what happens? We get to tabernacle. See, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. But then at the end of it, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will tabernacle in the house of the Lord forever. So you see that theme. It's all the way through the scriptures. It all ties together. That's why it's called a mikra. It's holy. And for a couple thousand years almost, they celebrated it with agricultural feasts and eating and everything that goes with it. But it was all pointing to the great fulfillment in Yeshua. We're on the other side of that fulfillment. And now we see it all. So keep your eyes on the feasts. Keep your eyes on the word. Exalt his word. Know how to handle it accurately. Study to show yourself approved, right? That's what the Bible says. I think you'll enjoy this. I'm going to take you on a little journey through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're going to look at the same instance out of the mouths of each of the gospel writers. The first three are called the synoptic gospels in theological circles. That is, they're, they're pretty much the same. It, they, there are differences, and they come from different perspectives, and they come with a, a decade or two separated between them, so they're invaluable. When you put them all together, you get even a bigger picture. But synoptic, of course, means they fit together. They go together in a row. They, they, they basically say the same thing, starting kind of with the genealogy or the birth of Jesus, then going all the way through to the crucifixion, resurrection, the synoptic. Optics. The Gospel of John has a lot of that in there, but it's different. It just starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he starts with, then came John the Baptist, who was saying, behold the Lamb of God. And then it goes right into the baptizing in the wilderness, the temptation of Jesus, and right into his ministry. Finally, to the crucifixion and resurrection. That's why in John, we find five chapters about the Lord's Supper. In the synoptics, we find three or four paragraphs about the Lord's Supper. And they're beautiful paragraphs. And they say what they need to say. And it's the Word of God, inspired by the same Holy Spirit. But by the time John writes his gospel, it stands apart from the other three in that way. But when you put all four together, wow, what a picture. What a picture of God's Word we have. That's why I'm going to go through all four taking you to the same account. The account that we're going to look at, something that really happened. And all four Gospels speak of it. If you have been in the Word for a long time, you will recognize these immediately, these accounts from each one. I want us to dive just a little bit deeper, and I want to show you some reasons behind the things that went on, and I want to show you the impact, and then we'll make it relevant to our walk with Yeshua HaMashiach. You ready for this journey? All right. Matthew chapter 26. That's where we'll start. Matthew chapter 26. And let's just begin at... Uh, oh, my goodness. Let's begin at... Just, I'm, I'm trying to look at the time. Let's begin at verse 45. Matthew chapter 26. I mean, there's so much before. I can give you a little bit. The bottom line is... They've, uh, they've come, they've taken the Lord's Supper. They uh, finish that. They go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. They have to go across the, the Kidron Brook, the Kidron Valley, right outside the gates of the city to the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, we're closing into hours now before he will be on the cross. If you will remember my preaching from last week about the Lord's Supper, remember I, I took you into the Gospel of John about those five chapters, and I showed you that they, his disciples, and I'm, I'm not judging them. It's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, right? I mean, if we were there during that time, been with Jesus for three years, saw all the amazing things we saw, and then to hear him talk about dying, he's in the prime of life. He's wowing the world. He's raised the dead, so why is he talking about himself dying 
And, and they have a hard time with that. That's why John chapter 14 starts off, listen, do not fear. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many tabernacles. <laughs> okay? And he goes from there. All right. So, so just follow me as we go through here. I'm going I'm to show you some of the emotions and things that happened and why they happened. But keep this in mind. They really didn't completely understand until they saw the crucifixion and that freaked them out. That is not what they were expecting. But then they saw the resurrected Jesus. And that changed everything. But even when they first heard of Jesus being resurrected, they didn't believe. A lot of them didn't. The only reason they did was because the women went to the grave not to go look for the resurrection, but to anoint the dead body. They couldn't do it the two days before because they were a Sabbath day and a special Sabbath because of the feasts. But the tomb was empty. The guards were gone. An angel of the Lord appeared and spoke and said, why are you looking for the living, the, 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 the dead among the living? He is risen, just like he said. They rushed back, told the disciples in the upper room who were basically hiding, and you'll see some of the reasons why in a moment, I'm not making fun of them. I probably would have been there too, especially if I was two or three of those guys. <laughs> but they were hiding. They figured they were next. There's nothing more gruesome than crucifixion, folks. The National Institutes of Health has an article on it. I've got it referenced in several of my books. They say it is one of the most hideous forms of death that the world has ever invented. And to this day, it's still in the top five of the hideous forms of death that humans have devised for people. Slow, suffocating, torturous, painful, agonizing, helplessness. And nobody's there to bring you any relief. Nobody's there to feel sorry for you. Instead, you're stripped and you're mocked in your suffering that goes on for hours, sometimes days. That's when God sent his son and he stepped into the flesh. The word became flesh and he dwelt among us so he could go to that form of death to pay the price for what we should have to pay. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. So that's the backdrop for what we're going to read. You'll recognize the story the account. <laughs> if you've seen one, you've seen them all. That's an inside joke. I'm sorry to our guests. Go back and listen a couple sermons ago. You'll get it. Let's start with verse 45. Jesus had been in the garden praying, agonizing. He knew what was coming. Finally, he would pray those words, but not my will, but yours. It means there was real temptation there for him. But then he returned to his disciples, verse 45, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? What he had told them before, he said, Please stay up. You're a little bit apart from me, but, but pray for me. He said, But now you're sleeping. You're lounging around. You're all on your cell phones playing games. He says, Look, behold, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve. Remember I told you before, now keep this in mind because this all goes into it. They had no clue that Judas was the betrayer. At the Lord's Supper. Several of the gospel accounts, including John, that gives the most detailed Jesus dips his bread and says to John secretly, this is the one that will betray me. But they question that. Like he was the keeper of the money. He was the one that provided their sustenance. He was the kind of the, the administrator of the whole band of ministry. Judas, why would he be a betrayer? 
He's the one that gets up and leaves the Lord's Supper. So many scholars believe that the disciples, since they never questioned that, they thought that he was just going to get some more food or some more supplies or doing some banking interests so that they could continue with the ministry. They had no clue. So now he says, my betrayer comes, and in comes an army. You'll hear them, the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rabbis, the Sanhedrin council, and their guards and servants. And the word servant could mean in kind of an indentured way, but it could also mean their administrative assistants that they had chosen. And, and there was a temple guard like the temple police force that had power in and around the temple and in Jerusalem. And the Roman government gave it to them. So these were the real cops. Now keep all that in mind when you see what happens next. That's all I'm going to, I'll just say that here and it'll apply to all the scriptures we're going to read. Now my betrayer comes. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. I'm going to stop here just a moment, make this very personal, in case you think that sounds weird. I've been the pastor here 38 years in about my sixth, seventh, eighth year of ministry. Had a staff member, member and a deacon that lost their ever-loving minds, but most of us didn't know it. They had it in their mind they were going to take the church for and they devised this great big plan. It was nasty. It was filthy. I don't want to go into it and drag up everything. I just want to show you something. Right before it happened, and I had no idea it was going to happen, I was out in the foyer out there speaking to people on the way out. And the deacon came up to me, grabbed me, and kissed me on my cheek, and said, some bad things are getting ready to happen. I just want you to know I'm standing with you on the cheek. He was the betrayer. I look back on that and I'm thinking, dude, do you have any idea what part you were playing in that drama? Unbelievable. Literally kissed my cheek. Several deacons in here know about it. They were deacons back then, active. Some of them are now inactive, but they were. Am, am I right, brother? I, I, I'm seeing a couple of people here that, that know. And there are a bunch of people that witnessed it. I'm not making this up. So I'm just saying, I'm not comparing myself to Jesus at all. I'm just saying I'm a man of God trying to do the work of God in God's house among God's people. And there was a betrayal going on that none of us knew about. And one of them came and kissed me on the cheek. I, I've never been so hurt and angry. And I don't mean like little feelings. I'm hurt. My feelings hurt. I'm just talking about in, the, in my soul, a man that I loved. I, Thought he loved me? This is what the disciples were feeling. Do you get it now? That's why I told that story. I know it was about me, but it was to make, you make it personal for you. It's about this. That happened. I know something of that pain. This church knows something of that. He kissed him. Verse 50. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, let me tell you, the high priest is the most powerful, the most important man in Jewish life in the entire Roman Empire, but particularly in the area of Judea and even Galilee. He had a lot of authority, a lot of power, highly revered. 
A lot of politics going on as to who would be his assistant or who would be his successor, on and on. It was nasty. It became filthy by this time. This is, the two, this is his assistant of the high priest. And somebody in this crowd cuts off his ear with a sword. In today's world, that would be aggravated assault and or attempted murder. A felony, many years of prison. Are y'all listening? Verse 52. Jesus said to him, put your sword back in his place. For all who draw the, draw the sword will die by the sword. Just giving a warning to this one. Do you think I could not call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of warrior angels? You know how many 12 legions is? Let me just put it simple for you. Pensacola Civic Center holds 10,000 people. 12 legions of warrior angels would be seven civic centers full. That's 12 legions, about 72,000 of warrior angels. You might say, well, you know, the American military has more soldiers than that. I ain't talking about soldiers, human soldiers. I'm talking about supernatural beings that surround the throne of God. Huge, strong, powerful, seven civic centers full. And he tells this one, that's what I have at my, I don't need your measly sword or your protection. And if you had been listening a little closer, you would know that what is happening was laid down before the foundation of the world. I am the Lamb of God. I am the Lamb. Say ha Elohim, the Lamb of God. I'm the one from the foundation of the world that has come to take away the sins of the world for all who would believe. Amen. I don't need your measly sword. I can speak and seven civic centers filled with gigantic warrior angels would be here. Does that make sense? All right. I won't have to be so dramatic on all four of them now. I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to lay down the feelings, the emotions, the power, the truth of what's going on. I love this next verse. He said, I could call down those angels, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? It what? Golgotha must happen. And in hours they will see it. Put your sword up. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion, guys, that you have to come out with swords and clubs to capture me? <laughs> every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and all that week, every day that week and, and year after year after year, and, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. And by the way, one of the prophecies would come from Zechariah, where the prophecy says, kill the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Jesus knew that was coming. He had already told several of them, well, Peter, right to his face, you'll deny me three times before this night's over. Don't be talking about how you'll never let this happen. The other disciples agree. Amen. Amen. We're right there with y'all. Other than John, who was the only one that appeared at the foot of the cross. We know that John was the youngest of them all. Doing all the math and working backwards, we know he died in the mid-90s A.D. All the other disciples were already passed before he did. He probably was between the age, he was probably 17 or 18 when he was first called in to the 12. And then just 2021 20, when Jesus was crucified. 
But that was pretty mature. I mean, kids were much more mature back then. Nothing against young people here today. I'm just saying it was a different life. It was a harder life. At 17, you were a grown man, and some of them were married and had families already. So keep that in mind. But he's the youngest of them all. All right. So now go to Mark chapter 14. Matthew, Mark. Now go over to chapter 14. Let's pick up at about the same place. Verse 43. Just as he was speaking, that's Jesus. Same thing. I'm picking right up where Matthew left off. Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going up at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him on the cheek. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest. There's that attempted murder. Cutting off his ear. Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me every day? I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. There's that fulfillment of Zechariah again. I love this next verse. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving the garment behind. Okay. Well, I don't want to see that image. I mean, how do you like that for a morning devotional? I mean, you know, now you can think about a naked man running through the streets. Well, but that's kind of, that's not a really great translation there. The, the overall translation is good, but I mean of that sentence because I did a deep word search on that, that whole structure of that Greek grammar. In the word, um, leaving nothing is not in the Greek. But what it says is a man wearing only or a man wearing a linen garment Drop that and fled. And the word that's usually translated naked in Greek, it specifically says in the Greek dictionary, this rarely means completely nude. It means stripped down to the barest of clothing, un underwear, we'd say. Well, what was it? Well, was at night, late at night in the Garden of Gethsemane. There were all kind of people that kind of camped up in the trees in the woods, homeless people or travelers, travelers. A lot of people traveled and they didn't have Motel 6s, guys, Holiday Inns. They were not very smart people because they couldn't stay in a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> oh, my. I'm sorry. That was like a dad joke right there, wasn't it? Yeah. No. So this one... Mark is writing this. Mark probably was one of the outer circle of disciples and was there and witnessed it. I mean, this is kind of an eyewitness statement. The guy was probably camping under the tree, saw the commotion and mess, probably got up. Maybe somebody grabbed him and grabbed the linen garment. Maybe he was wrapped in a linen garment and, and grabbed it. And all he had on underneath was just the bare necessities. And off he took. And whoever saw it said, oh, and by the way, there was a naked man running through the woods about that same time. See, this is what I like about the scriptures. It just gets down to every detail of the truth and hides nothing. Some people wonder, well, who was this? Some scholars say it probably was Mark himself, but it doesn't say that. Also, please know that more than likely, Peter is the one who's dictating a lot of these things to Mark. More than likely. We don't know that for sure, but there seems to be some scholarly evidence that that's true. Mark is the oldest. It was written first in, whether it was written first or not, we don't know, but it was public, published first and not by a publisher. I mean, by published, I mean putting down and, and distributed throughout to the churches and to the empire. So Mark was first then Matthew, then Luke, then John. That's the order they were written in. Now, they're arranged, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's the same account. Did you see it? Except with that little tidbit thrown in there. 
Which is why if you're going to tell your children, read it for devotional, send them to Matthew. Don't send them to Mark. <laughs> Mommy, who's this naked man right up there? <laughs> anyway, it's funny. Can you say naked in church on a Sunday morning? Can you say? Okay. No, no, just. <laughs> Y'all quit your mumbling. Some of it, I still have really good ears. Some of it, I heard just what you said. Anyway. <laughs> now let's go to Luke. Chapter 22. Jump in on the same thing. Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Excuse me, for, for, let's do verse 47. Now, while Jesus was still speaking to them, a crowd came, came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus and kissed him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man? with a kiss. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Okay, so almost all of them said this. Verse 50, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his, now we hear right ear again. And Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Now, this is the first time we've heard this. Then Jesus said to the chief, see, this is why the synoptics are important. You put them all together. They're telling the same account, but these eyewitnesses, and they remember things and see things. Mark remembered a naked man. What does that say about him? I don't know. Um, God, Matthew, I mean, Luke, he's a historian. He's talked to all, a bunch of eyewitnesses. He starts off by saying that. And, and so, this was a big deal, this, this healing. Just hang on. Touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come to me with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. You know what he's saying? But this is Satan's world. You know what else he's saying? But he's not saying it. And I'm going to use that against Satan. He's going to walk right into the trap. He already thinks he's putting me on the cross because he betrayed me through Judas. He doesn't know that I'm the lamb slain from the foundation. I came to do this. It must happen to fulfill the scriptures, the ones that Satan, supernatural Satan, but he couldn't see, didn't have the Holy Spirit of God. He couldn't read through the cryptic writings, it seemed. He didn't know. He thought. That's why Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians, if the rulers of this age had only known, they would not have crucified the Son of God. Why? Because that was Satan's death nail. That's why Revelation 12 says, woe unto you earth in the very last days. Because Satan has been thrown down. Where? At Calvary's cross and at the resurrection. And he is filled with rage. He was tricked. You know, the smart one. Because he knows his time is short. That one, that one verse explains everything you're seeing in the world. He is filled with rage and you can see it. What does that mean? He knows his time is short. The more arrogant and prideful and deranged and deluded he gets, the more we know how much closer we are. The derangement of mind that Paul prophesied in Romans 1, that goes with all of that. So there's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now let me tell you what happens. John writes. He probably writes in the 90s AD, early, or maybe in the late 80s. All the other disciples are gone. John's an old man now. Oh, he's been persecuted, been thrown on a prison camp island, Patmos, because he wouldn't worship the emperor Domitian who demanded that he sacrifice a pig on an altar. 
John just said, I'm not going to do it. But John now writes the gospel. And we, listen, we could get by without the gospel of John if we had to, but I'm so glad we don't have to because he fills in so much information because he's had time. He's been writing it all of these decades. He's been pondering. He's been preaching it. He's been teaching it. Plus now he's had access to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which have revived a lot of memories like, oh, yeah, but, but let me add more to that. Let me fill in the gaps. Let me make it fuller. And so that's what John's about. That's why I say I love it. I, I, we could do without it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are fine. But my gosh, how much more we know now. But now in chapter 18, verse 1, when, Gen when Jesus had finished praying, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now, John was there. John was there, eyewitness. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, See, now he doesn't even, now he just says he's the one that betrayed. Of course he would know that. It's been decades. Judas knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to that grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and other weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, here we go, I told you. I remember Jesus had said earlier, no man will take my life from me. I'm going to lay it down. That's why he would have told this one, I don't need your stinking sword. <laughs> I've got seven civic centers filled with gigantic warrior angels. I'm doing this because this is what I came for. And watch. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Now, now John records something that's fascinating. He witnessed. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back from him and fell to the ground. Doesn't mean they fell down to worship. It means they stumbled over each other, and it was a domino effect. It's just his presence, just the way he spoke those words. They go all the way back from the Greek to the Hebrew, basically the same structure when Moses was standing at the burning bush and said, who am I going to tell Pharaoh sent me? And God says, I am who I am. You tell him the great I am has sent you. But however he spoke it, he might have spoken it in Hebrew and used those very same words. Maybe that's why they said, oh, my gosh, this is blasphemy. And they said, get out of my way, get out of my way. Before long, it was a whole domino effect. John remembered that vividly. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Because they, they asked him, I'm sorry, verse 7 said, and again he asked him, who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua of Nazareth. I told you, I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. He's pointing to his disciples. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, <laughs> did that surprise any of y'all? <laughs> Who had, you could put Carl Gallup's there because we, we, Simon and I have a lot in common and I'm talking about the bad stuff. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, John, see what John's doing? He's telling us that none of the other three would tell us. We're going to talk about this in just a moment. And then he tells us the, the high priest servant, his name. That becomes a handy fact in just a few moments. John fills in the gaps. He tells us who it was. He tells us which ear, the right ear. I think Matthew did too, or Luke. Uh, Luke probably did. And, but then he tells us the name of the servant. John's trying to tell the reading audience now, decades later, I know what I'm talking about. 
I was there. I knew these people. I knew Malchus. Of course, I knew all the disciples. And of course, I knew Peter. I was always rolling my eyes at Peter. <laughs> Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? All right, look at me for a moment. Why would John call Peter out like that? Matthew, Mark, and Luke were decent enough not to do it. Kind of set you up for that. This makes the best sense of all. The Bible doesn't say it, but a lot of scholars believe this as well because it just fits common sense. Occam's razor. The simplest answer is usually the correct one. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written during the lifetime of Peter. So they included, truthfully, what happened. They omitted the name. Why? He could rot away in prison, perhaps, if somebody wanted to drag it all back up. And it was in writing by his own friends that were there. We saw him. It was Peter. Instead, they said, one of us. Y'all have to guess which one. I don't think that would have been too hard to guess. But anyway, <laughs> this is what I love. And it's missed a lot. <sighs> Peter could have been arrested right there for attempted murder. He might have been given the death sentence and or at least rotted in prison for the rest of his life. In the meantime, Jesus is trying to get to Calvary. And he loves that boy, Peter. So you know what Jesus does? He cleans up Peter's mess and leaves no evidence for anybody to put him in prison. He picks up the ear. He puts it on the man's head. He heals him. Now, I'm going to talk about that, that in a moment. The man can't go off saying, he cut my ear off. And everybody's going to say, you out of your mind. Boy, put him in the, he got both ears. What are you talking about? Well, well, Jesus put it back on. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, so you're saying Jesus is a miracle worker now, right? Now you're going to prison for being a blasphemer. We're going to kick you out of the synagogue. What do you think he is, the son of God? I mean, you know, Jesus fixed it. He fixed it. Now, the Greek word there for he took the ear and placed it on, and, and well, he doesn't say place it on, but he says, but he, he touched the man and healed his ear. That word touched in Greek, and I don't want to bore you with all the words, but I'm just telling you what it means. You can go look it up later for those of you that are so inclined to do so. So please look it up. Um, the word means to touch somebody, and that touch affects that person. It changes things. It's like the touch of a doctor. Or if you come up here and we pray and, and I lay my hand on your shoulder or on your head and we pray and the prayer is answered maybe, or you feel the presence of God during that, that's the word that would be used in Greek. There's a touch that, a, that affected something. Does that, does that make sense? That's the word. Almost all the tr English translations, they just went up and touched him, which makes us think he just went up and said... Uh, like, like, like all the moms do. They're there. <laughs> They're there. Put a little spit on it and it'll be fine. <laughs> Am I right, moms? <laughs> it's not that. In fact, not only does it mean a touch that changes things in a person's life, but it also means a firm grip. So he gripped the guy. And so what seems to be Occam's razor's answer is that he picks up the ear, is laying in the dirt, blood's gushing from the man's head. He's squalling like a child. I know I would be. Amen. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine the pain of that? No. He, you say, well, God, why is that attempted murder? Peter wasn't aiming for his ear. He was aiming for the head or the neck. 
If he was trying to bring the sword this way, he was going to split him right in half like a watermelon. If he was bringing the sword this way, he was going to decapitate him. The dude saw the sword, saw Peter draw the sword, looked at him, saw him looking at him, and he pulled his head just in time, and it went and sliced it right off. And there's the ear. And here are the guards with swords and clubs, the ones that can make, they're the temple guards. They can make an arrest right then. Jesus takes a moment and he basically says to them, before you take me away, this man is screaming, please give me five seconds. I want to help him. Whether they answered or not, they didn't say no. He stoops down, he picks it up like the creator he is. Ata. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. He picks it up. And he, that Greek word, he presses it in. And he grabs him. He's probably, probably hugging the man, whispering in his ear. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Are you okay? It's going to be okay. I don't know. That's what that word means. He's gripping him tightly, and he's going to do something that's going to change his life because of it. He puts it up there. He pulls his hand away. And everybody goes, oh, what did we just see? Now, you would think at that moment the guards might have turned around and went back and said, we can't arrest this dude. But they had come with a mission. They had come with a purpose. And God had ordained this. So they were given over to the evil of their hearts because now their time of darkness had come. Does all that make sense? You put all the Gospels together and you understand the emotions and the biblical things that are happening here. Watch. The evidence is gone. Peter melts into the crowd. It's a huge crowd. He melts into the crowd. They can't lay their hands on him. All the disciples scattered, which means Peter as well. They all ran. Kill the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. The scriptures were starting to be fulfilled right there in that garden. But Peter could not be arrested. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Well, we, we saw it. You cut his ear off. Really prove it. <laughs> Well, a bunch of eyewitnesses, so they're all crazy, huh? Look, the guy's got his ear. But, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. What, what are y'all talking about? It is done. And now Jesus goes to the cross. Peter goes and hides along with the other disciples. But not yet. Watch this. Stay right there in chapter 18. And go to verse 15. And remember what Jesus told Peter in John chapter 14 before this night is over. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus, that is, at a distance, because this disciple was known to the high priest. <laughs> he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. Y'all listen to me. This disciple was known to the high priest. What, he did, what did he just do to the high priest? He cut off his servant. He cut off his chief administrator's ear. But now there's no evidence of it. So Peter feels bold enough to at least follow at a distance. But they know each other. See, you might really never have seen that before, but watch this. Verse 16, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the girl on, uh, on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, what? Who, me? I am not. First denial. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with him, so now he's back out warming himself. 
Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about the disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I have always taught in synagogues or at the temples with all the Jews together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they will know what I said. Bap! When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I said something wrong, Jesus said, testify to what was wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, aren't you one of his disciples? He said, I am not. There's denial too. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. At that moment, the rooster began to crow. See, a lot of times when we think about Peter's denial three times, we think, man, what a jerk he was. Why, why would he do that? I'm not making any excuses for Peter. Peter was terrified for his life, not just of the possible crucifixion. He didn't know they were going to crucify Jesus yet. He just knew he was arrested. The next day he would see it and then get really terrified. The deal was he's still thinking, they could still get me. They could still get up a bunch of witnesses. They could, you know, what he doesn't know is the forensics of what we now know. It would have been impossible to, to, to put him in prison for something that nobody could prove. Even the man they claimed it happened to. He's standing there with a whole ear. So obviously, y'all just thought he cut the ear off, unless you're trying to tell us he's the son of God, which nobody would do. But Peter, I mean, get inside his head. I'm not making excuses for him. He denied Jesus three times. But he's thinking, if I say yes, and here's the, the, the chief priest's uh, servant's relative, and I know the chief priest, and he knows me, which meant he probably knew the servant and probably the relative. And the relative says, but weren't you, you were there, weren't you in there? There's a huge crowd. I'm telling you, it was easy. It was dark. They didn't have football stadium lights in the Garden of Gethsemane. They came with torches. And all those were being done like this. And, you know, you saw shadows going everywhere and a crowd of people. It was, it was a mess. That's why when Jesus said, I am, they, get, get back, get back, they all fall down in the dark. I mean, it was a mess. Peter draws his sword. Whap! The guy ducked. Bam! Off came the ear. Jesus said, put your sword up. Man, don't you know what I'm doing here? He said, guys, give me a second. And the man screamed, Wow! I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm going to bleed to death. Jesus picks up the ear, puts it on him, whispers in his ear, pulls his hand back. It's though it never happened. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. We sing a praise song that says, You see my sin. You see my struggles, but you still call me friend. <laughs> Listen to me, guys. This last week, Yom Kippur, that is a representation of God by the blood of the Lamb covering our sin if we have come to him. Peter got his sin covered that night by a touch from Jesus that saved his life. Then Jesus went to the cross to save us. And I'm telling you guys, this same principle of what we see here works in our lives. In fact, some of us, I use the word us, have things almost like that, not that we were attempted murderers, but have, I mean, don't answer out loud, but haven't you ever done something or said something or haven't you cut off the ear of somebody in the past and afterwards you said, that was stupid. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. And then some of you could even say, along with me, that it could have gotten you in some big trouble. 
But in the midst of it, you were serving the Lord. It was, it, was, it was an emotional response. It was a whim kind of thing, but you said it or you did it. And now you're in a mess. But I bet you some of you can say, but then something miraculous happened. I can say that. My wife knows. I can say that. And it was gone. Miraculously, humanly speaking, that could have never happened. But it just went away. And it's like the Lord said, now, stupid boy, don't do that again. But I've taken care of this because you are my faithful servant. You exalt my word. You exalt my name. And I'm going to keep using you. And I'm going to touch this. Your sins, Carl, are many, <laughs> but my mercy is more. Can you say that about yourselves? If you think long enough, if you've lived to be as old as I am, you can say it several times. I mean, I've told you this before, my wife and I know, I mean, all the time I was a deputy sheriff. I mean, two different sheriff's offices for a decade getting shot at and shooting back at people and everything else that went with it. I had a deputy sheriff say to me at the, almost at the end of those 10 years, right to my face in my wife's hearing, you must have a bunch of angels around you because you have walked right through bear traps laid for you all throughout your career and you've walked right through them. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't know that I had until I figured what he was talking about. And I said, oh, my gosh. Our sins, there are many. But his mercy is more. If we're under his blood and we're exalting his word and exalting his name and making ourselves useful to his kingdom, he wants to keep us. I'm not saying that God's just going to wipe out every little stupid mistake we make and make it go away because he's a magic genie in a bottle or a spare tire in a trunk. I'm not saying that. Peter wouldn't say it either. That's why Peter, even though that happened, he's still a human. He still has the emotions. He still has the fear. He's standing around fires denying that he even knew Jesus. Didn't want to be associated with what he was just involved in. Excuse me. What he just did. Even though Jesus had fixed it, he wasn't at the mental point yet to understand it. That's why we have addiction ministries here, because people that get caught up in addictions, it's difficult. And that involves almost all of us to one degree or other, either personally and or family members and or good dear friends. But you get caught up in it. And sometimes even when you're delivered, you walk around like a fish that's out of water and you get put back in the water and you don't realize it's okay now. It takes a while. It takes encouragement, it takes healing, it takes prayer, it takes time. It ta Peter was in one of those states. But the bottom line is, we look at Peter's life. He was one of the first of the men to rush to the tomb when the women came back. He goes in, he sees it, he becomes this, and then the Lord appears to him, and he becomes this great man of God, not perfect, but he does. The next thing you know, he's the, the lead pastor. The church is born in downtown Jerusalem. He's the one that stands and preached on that Pentecost day and 3,000 people were saved. God knew that he was going to do that. Jesus had already told him, on your faith, I'm going to build my church. Boy, you can't be cutting off the high priest, chief assistant's ear trying to cut off his head. You idiot. Come here, sir. Okay, leave my boy alone. Okay, good. All right, you can take me to the cross now. I mean, think of that. That's what all that was about. That's why Peter was doing the denying. It doesn't free. I guarantee you, Peter regretted that ear thing and the denial for the rest of his life. I guarantee you it haunted him. I guarantee you he had to curl up in a ball sometimes on the couch. How can you deal with the fact of knowing that you did that stupid thing, you almost killed a man right in front of the cops. But Jesus, whom you've been walking with for three years, didn't have to do what he did. But he took all the evidence away and made you a free person. May I tell you, 
Calvary's cross did that for everybody in here who's born again. He took our sin nature and cast it away as if it never happened. Satan can say, but, but, you know, but, but Carl, but, but, you know, but Ken, you, did you see what they did? And, and the Lord God's going to say, they're under the blood. I didn't see nothing. I don't see nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. They're under the blood. That's, we often make this little theological joke. It's not really a joke. This theological cute thing. The Bible says that he has, God has through the blood of his son, he has justified us before him. And the way to remember that big word is to just remember this. It's just as if I'd never sinned, justified the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. You know our failures. You know our sin. Yet you still call us friend. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't strike to you down for every thought you have and everything you say and everything you do that's outside of his word? If you're under the blood, you are his friend. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have consequences follow you sometimes. But what it means is you get it right with God, you're right with him because you're under the blood. Now that is why we sing the song, My Victory is in Jesus, my Savior forever. Give the Lord a big old hand of praise. Melech HaMelechim, the King of Kings. Adonai HaAronim, the Lord of Lords. Shimka Ad Olam. Great is your name. Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Shemi Ephafe, and how beautiful is that name. Let's pray together. In the opening chapters of my brand new book, you'll journey back 2,000 years. In the theater of your mind, you'll be placed squarely in the company of Jesus and his disciples. You'll be there when he discloses eye-popping insights to those who are the closest to him. The remaining chapters will take you through one biblical revelation after another, revelations that will at times leave you breathless from what you've seen. You'll also understand why most of the world, along with huge portions of today's institutional church, is is oblivious to what's taking place around them in real time. And this grand demonic delusion is happening right in the midst of the most prophetic time since the first coming of Yeshua. But first, we have to see it. In Eyes to See, you will. Eyes to See is being featured on many Christian media programs, and it's available around the world from all of your favorite internet booksellers, as well as in a multiplicity of bookstores. Or you can order directly from my offices at carlgallops.com slash store, where you can communicate with real people and even get your copy signed if you wish. While there, don't forget to click on the book's website link to read inside. Almost 50 pages of content. Do you have eyes to see? You will after you've turned the last page of this book. I can guarantee it. Order your copy now. This changes everything.